Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you and praise you. You are a redeemer. You are a gracious God. You are our comforter. You are our helper. You are our rock. You are our hope. You are our father. And you are our shepherd. Help us to understand more what it means to have you, the eternal triune God, as our shepherd. And how we might live in light of that. And how we might take hope in that truth. Bless this time. May your spirit work within each one of us to bring us toward perfection, to the image of Christ, from one degree of glory to another, that we would be different, that we would be less of ourselves and more of Christ. Even over the internet, even over the Zoom meeting, because your word and your spirit they're not bound. Bless this time we pray in Christ. Amen. So, it doesn't really need any introduction. I mean, we're all gathered here for the first time over Zoom because fear is consuming our culture. Fear is consuming our culture. And in fact, fear is spreading faster than COVID-19 is. Have you realized that? That fear is spreading faster than COVID-19 is. And fear is even more contagious than COVID-19 is. Can you guys still hear me? Okay. Fear is more contagious than COVID-19 is. And now there's different types of fears, and it's, it's my hope and prayer that as the Lord wills, we'll spend a couple weeks looking at a biblical theology of fear, of what fear is, the different types of fears. There is a natural fear, which is not, not bad. You stand on the edge of a cliff, you, you should be afraid. That's a protection. There is a, a spiritual special fear that is reserved for the Lord, but then there is a sinful fear which is sweeping through the world right now. Fear distracts us from our duties. Fear distracts us from our duties, and fear reveals our sin. Fear exposes our idols. What a beautiful time that we have right now to look at why are we afraid? What does Scripture have to say about the fear that we have? And that's going to help expose our idols. And now that they're exposed, we know what we need to do. And the power of the Spirit with the Word put them to death. Make no provision for them. Ultimately, fear dethrones God. Fear dethrones God and magnifies and exalts the creature. Because what we're saying is, I'm more afraid of this situation or this person or this creature than I am of the one with whom it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of. I'm more afraid of this situation or this person or this thing more than I believe the promises of God. And so what we've done is we've broken some of the Ten Commandments, haven't we? We've lifted some things up above God and we've pulled God down lower. Today, God, I know you're scary, but you're also gentle. You're like a big teddy bear. You're like an old grandpa. It, you know, you're gonna, it's going to be okay, but this thing's really scary. And I don't know if you have control over it, and I don't know if you can hear me, and I don't know if you care. How should we respond in times like this? Well, there's a number of responses that we must have, but today I want to focus on what I see as the most important one, the most important one. We must know, love, and meditate on the God of the Bible. We must meditate on the character of Yahweh. And in meditating, we must trust in him. And that's what David does here for us in Psalm 23. Psalm 23. And I sent out 
And so some of you, you have the outline. And if somebody wants to post that in the chat so that others might be able to have it, that would be helpful. But it starts out with three major headings, David's assertion, David's affirmations, and David's assurance. And underneath, there's some subpoints. What is David's assertion? Yahweh is my shepherd. What are David's affirmations? Yahweh, it's his satisfaction. It's his sustenance. It's his preservation. It's his protection. And David's assurance. David's assurance is Yahweh's security. David's assurance is Yahweh's pursuit of him. All of these things that David holds to are all rooted in who Yahweh is. And so if we want this assurance, and if we want to live lives that are glorifying to God, especially in the midst of trials, in light of fears, we need to take heed to what David, through the Holy Spirit, records for us. I'll read through it. Psalm 23. A psalm by David. Yahweh is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And we talked about that last week, his name's sake. Verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, we don't have enough time to go as deep as this psalm goes, but we're going to skim across the surface and hopefully we can glean some truths here. The first thing we notice is that it is a psalm by David. A psalm is a song of praise. And when it's used in scripture, it's always a song of praise to Yahweh. And the first use of this word testifies to the beauty of it. Exodus 15, you can note this down and I'll read it for you. Moses sings a song to Yahweh and says, I will sing to Yahweh for he's highly exalted. The horse and his rider, he's hurled into the sea. Yahweh is my strength and my psalm. Yahweh is my strength and my psalm. And he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will extol him. Yahweh is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. Well, as we get into... That's the introduction. That's how we know who wrote it. Let's look at verse 1. David's assertion. Yahweh is my shepherd. Let's just stop right there. This name Yahweh, a beautiful name. Exodus 3 gives us the best explanation of it. Exodus 3, you know, the angel of Yahweh appears to Moses. The bush was burning with fire, but it was not consumed. This was, this was a picture, right? This was a picture of the self-sufficient God. He needs nothing. The bush was not consumed. He needed no oxygen for fire. He needed no fuel for fire. He just is fire of himself, for himself, to himself, from himself. Moses sees this, and Yahweh calls to him. Moses, Moses. And then you drop down a little bit further. Verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent you. That's what we see pictured. He is. This fire just is. You don't know where it came from, where it's going, how it's even subsisting there. How it's even existing there. It just is. And it's interesting. 
Turn over a couple pages to Exodus 6, verse 2. God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh, and I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. Well, a, a quick glance through Genesis, you see Yahweh all over the place. You see Yahweh being used in the garden, not by the serpent, not by Eve when the serpent's dealing with her. So what, what is this talking about? They didn't get to see those promises that Yahweh carries this idea of this covenant-keeping God. He's made himself known by fulfilling his promises. Abraham did not inherit the land. He was trusting in the promises. But Moses and the people of Israel would see those promises given to their forefathers, and by that it's made known. I am a covenant-keeping God. Has God made himself known to you, Christian? Has he shown to you in your life that you can trust him? That he is a covenant-keeping God? That the only time God doesn't do what he says he will do is when he gives you mercy and when he gives you grace. And then we see Yahweh is a shepherd. And this term is lost on us to the West. There's some of us that have studied I heard some sermons on this, may have a better grasp of it. But in the West, we drive cattle from behind. We drive sheep. We drive herds of animals from behind. Not in the East, not in the ancient Near East. They lead them. They go out in front. They know them by name. They know which animal is which. And they call them to come where they are. They don't get behind and push them. They, they, they call them and they lead them. And David, we know David was a shepherd of the sheep. We know the shepherd was one of the first occupations of mankind. Who was a shepherd in Genesis chapter 4? Abel. Shepherding was a taxing job. It didn't end when the sun went down. The responsibility consumed every single minute. Uh, think about, you know, it's kind of similar to the job that moms have with young children. It's never ending. It's always going. Now imagine that you had 50, 100 tiny little kids under five, all at your house all at once. But you weren't in your house, you were outside. Trying to keep them all together. It is a, a taxing job. And it's a responsibility that consumed every minute of every hour of the day. They would, the shepherds would sleep with the sheep in order to ensure their safety and predators during the night so that if something came, they were right there ready to fight off attackers. And it's interesting. Note this from, from the text. It, David doesn't say, Yahweh has appointed for me a shepherd. No, he, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say, David doesn't say, God has given me a hireling. God has appointed someone to shepherd over me. No, it says, Yahweh, the covenant-keeping triune God, Father, Son, Spirit, is my shepherd. It doesn't say he's my neighbor's shepherd. It doesn't say it's my brother's shepherd or my sister's shepherd. It's my shepherd. A hireling would not have the same care and concern for the sheep that the owner would have. A hireling would often neglect or abuse the sheep because he didn't have a personal vested interest. There was no love relationship between the sheep and the hireling. But there is great love and condescension that Yahweh appoints to himself. It is the most menial. Why was David a shepherd of the sheep? Because he was the youngest. That's what the youngest would do. It's a hard taxing job. And Yahweh says that he is going to condescend to that level and take that job because of his great love. The supreme being will take the seemingly low task of being a shepherd. Now, in light of that, well, what do we see here? We see David's affirmations from 23, half of 23, 1, all the way to verse 4. And the first one is Yahweh's satisfaction. He says, I shall not want. Because David has Yahweh as his shepherd, he won't lack. Not ever. And this concept of, of lacking implies that there is a standard of completeness to which can be met. 
or it can, it can lack from, and he's going to be in that area where it's not lacking. It's interesting, though, the, the way the grammar is worded in this literally reads, I will never lack. I will never lack. It's an emphatic negation. There's this completeness and abundance that David is referring to here when he says he will never lack because Yahweh is my shepherd. Not because he's smart, not because he made good business decisions, not because he was endowed with property or finances. No, because Yahweh is my shepherd. And this, this appeals to a quantity or category, not necessarily quality or degree. But David is so immeasurably blessed by having Yahweh as his shepherd that he knows there's never going to arise a situation in which he would be in need of something that is necessary for his good since he's cared for by Yahweh, the shepherd. The Apostle Paul understands this. Philippians 4, 11 through 19. Paul writes, not that I speak from want or from lack, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am. Sometimes we, we recognize, you know, yeah, God will provide my every need, but sometimes we haven't learned to be content with that. Sometimes we want more than what God has promised in his word. Uh, sometimes we think, God, I know that, that you're a good God, you've given me good gifts, but the moment we say that, but sin is crouching at our door. Loved ones, we have to learn to be content. Because we're, that's not part of our flesh. That's not part of how we normally are. That's something that we have to learn to do. And God in his grace supplies it for us. I have learned to be content, Paul says, in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering in need. I can do all things through him or in Christ who strengthens me. This is what this verse is referring to, learning to be content. Nevertheless, you've done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek the profit, which it increases to your account. But I've received everything in full, and I have an abundance, and I'm amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you've sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And, listen to this, 19, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. This is just beautiful. I mean, we know this. We've been studying through Ephesians 1. We've been gifted every spiritual blessing. Well, back to Psalm 23. Let's look at verse 2. Let's look at Yahweh's sustenance. It says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. Whereas the phrase, I will never lack, was referring to a quantity or categories. This phrase is referring to quality or fullness or degrees. So I'm never going to lack categorically. And now he's going to fill up those categories in their fullness and degrees. These pastures are the best kinds of grass. This is, this is like, this, this is fresh Grass. It's, he makes me lie down in pastures of fresh grass. You know, when, when the seasons change and the rain falls and, and you start to see the, the sprouting grass come up or when you go to the store and you get like wheat grass to throw in your juices or something and it's, it's just barely coming up and it's so fresh and so green and so luscious. That's what Yahweh does here. The best. And you know what's interesting? If you know anything about Israel's terrain, this is no small feat. There's two seasons, wet and hot. There's the rain season, and then there's everything else. All the water dumps at once. And then it basically becomes desert-like. And notice that it doesn't say a pasture. No, 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 this is abundant. 
pastures plural. Herein lies an enormous abundance of fresh supply, which is a rarity. And this word for fresh grass is the same one used by Moses when he speaks of the benefit of teaching being like dew on the fresh grass. Deuteronomy 32, 2. Let my teaching drop as rain, my speech distill as dew as the droplets on fresh grass. So the Lord is supplying not only physical needs, but spiritual needs to his sheep, to those who are his own. And the idea behind he makes me, he's causing me to do it. It's repeatedly being done. It's not a one and done kind of thing. He keeps giving these things. He keeps causing me to lie down, David says. He keeps giving me fresh grass. This shepherd cares for David. He will never lack anything categorically. He will never lack anything in degree. So summing that up, you would say, this testimony is a fact, not only will David never have lack, but when Yahweh does provide for him, this isn't something second class. When Yahweh is providing for him, he's giving him the creme de la creme. You know, uh, you used to be able to, and sometimes you still can if you go to the grocery store, you get those glass bottles of milk. And you open it up, and what's right on the top? Is a cream. And maybe some of you would fight for that. You get your little spoon that's long and narrow and go in. Who gets to eat the cream off the top, right? And then you also have, you know, the Walmart milk, which is like what we get, which is like $1.50. And you're just like, well, at least it's white. And there's no chunks in it. Like Yahweh is giving David the cream off the top. That's what Yahweh does as a shepherd for his sheep. Loved ones, take heart and know this. This is your shepherd. Do you know what the first lie was? God is needlessly restrictive. You could eat from all these trees in the garden except for that one. How come he didn't give you that one? He's he has everything. He could give it to you, but he's holding it back from you. When we start believing that, we've stepped into sin. And our desires are wrong. God gives an abundance and God gives good gifts. David continues. He leads me beside quiet waters. Or restful waters. This isn't the leading up to rushing rivers that could prove to be dangerous or threatening. No, this is that calm water is the goal or the objective of the careful leading. There's not only provision, but there's also protection. God is making sure that his sheep are provided for and that they're protected. He's not just saying, oh, man, I forgot to, forgot to feed the sheep. All right, well, let's just find where's the closest thing because I got stuff to do. No. Because a loud and treacherous river may frighten a sheep, not allowing it to drink and quench its thirst for the day. If it's moving too fast, one of two things is going to happen. That sheep will not drink from it because it's scared. Or it will try and fall in and be swept away. But God finds the best pastures, the best waters. This shows an emphasis on the forethought, on the predetermination, on the tenderness exhibited to cater to an animal that is dependent upon him. And truth be told, we're all dependent upon God. Did you know that God tenderly cares for you like this, Christian? For you. This is a situation in the world that we're facing, that you're facing. It's not meant to harm you. You look around, all the fear, all the panic, everything that's going on. God's on his throne. He's ordained this. It's not meant to harm us. This is meant to drive us to him, to our shepherd who will sustain us. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not, do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Well, we come to verse 3, Yahweh's preservation. He restores my soul. 
this is interesting. This word for restores is actually returning, turning. It's, it's repentance is, is uh, the same word. David is asserting that Yahweh brings his soul back. He doesn't say from where, but it's from a damaging pathway to an edifying one. Yahweh's been providing abundantly for David in every basic need, as we've seen throughout the psalm. We see that the shepherd's care is so comprehensive that it includes restoration of even the faults and the damages that the sheep inflict upon themselves. So he's taken all this time up front to say, green pastures, quiet waters, all these external stuff is taken care of. But what about where the war really rages on? What about where the trouble really is inside my soul? Well, your shepherd takes care of that too. He returns your soul back to where it should be. Back to life. He's every basic need. No matter what the extent of depravity or mortality, no matter the source thereof, Yahweh will restore and renew David to a state of perfect health and fullness because David is his. Because David belongs to him. Christian, do you know this love? Do you know this love? If you're outside of Christ, you know you long for this love, but you'll never have it. You'll only have glimpses and shadows of it, but never the substance until you turn from your sin and you come to Christ. This is an exclusive kind of love that is only for sheep. And if you don't come to Christ, you've proved you're a goat. But nevertheless, the same conditions would apply to you. Turn from your sin. Come to Christ and be healed. David continues, he leads me on paths of righteousness for his namesake. What's a righteous paths? It's simple. It's the right paths. He takes me on the right ones. A sovereign, a divine, authoritative guidance that brings its travelers to a predetermined location. Sounds a little bit like Ephesians 1, too, doesn't that? It's this stuff's woven all throughout scripture. It's one author, 66 books. That's why everything comes together in the way that it does. These paths are the right paths. It's not a location that someone can travel alone. Yahweh does not lead his sheep astray, but always leads according to his nature. And in his nature, he is righteous. Yahweh will lead his own home. This is a stark contrast to the sheep that Isaiah described. If you recall in Isaiah 53, 6, you remember that each of us like sheep have gone astray, each one to his own way. But when the chief shepherd comes, he grabs those sheep and takes them from their own ways and puts them on the righteous path, on the right path where their feet will not slip. Well, why would he do this? How do we know that we can trust he's going to do this for us? What's the, what's the next part of that verse say? For his name's sake. For his name's sake, he puts his name on the line. You may be the worst scoundrel ever, the worst of sinners ever. But if you're in Christ, God's placed his name on the line for you and will not fail. You remember when, when Moses led the people out and they were going into the land and Yahweh, even when he became angry at them, what, what did Moses do? Lord, for the sake of your great name, for your glory. And that's given to us as a picture so that we might know how far we sin and how far we drift and how far we go. If we be true Christians and if we be in Christ, God will bring us back because he's placed his name on the line. So it's not really about you. It's about his great name. There's comfort in that. When I hear things like that, when I read that in the scripture, my heart longs to obey. My heart longs to come to him knowing that he will forgive me. That I can have hope. And what about you? Does that make your heart sing? 
if he does this for his namesake, he didn't have to do it that way. He could have done it a different way. God will not fail because he doesn't do this for us. This is for the renown of his name and the God-centeredness of God. Well, in verse 4, we see Yahweh's protection. Yahweh's protection. Now, this is great. I love this. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. So, the idea behind valley of shadow of death, what is the valley of the shadow of death? You get that question a lot probably, or you've asked it before. It's literally a valley of deep darkness. It's a valley of deep darkness. The, the word carries with it not only the absence of light, but the presence of sorrow. Absence of light, presence of sorrow. It's not just dark, it's gloomy. You know, like when you were a kid and you watched something that was kind of scary. And then you had to go to bed and the lights were turned out. And you were afraid. That's what this is. Although there are real threats out there. It's a darkness that is the furthest point from the light, as Amos 5.8 tells us. But it's not so dark that one could hide from the gaze of God. This word is used a few times, Amos 5.8, which I just mentioned, and Job 34.22. There is no darkness or deep shadow where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. Yeah, it's deep darkness. But God still sees it. And you know what? This deep darkness is the earth that we live in. This is the deep darkness that the Father sent his Son into on your behalf. The people, Isaiah 9 says, who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. And we know that light is Christ. Fear no evil. This is, this is beautiful. I will never even begin to fear evil. When you want to bring out the full thrust of the grammar here, even though I walk in or through a valley of deepest darkness, I would never begin to fear evil. I'm never going to even begin to enter into that state. Star English sometimes doesn't do things justice. It's a great translation, but bringing out that full thrust, I will never begin to enter into a state of fear. Why? Because you are with me. Because you are with me. Notice the emotion. Notice the trust. Notice the personalness. And notice that it's through this valley. It's not to this valley. It's through it. But notice this personal emotion and trust. Did you see what just happened there? I fear no evil. Why? Because you, he just changed. He was talking about God. Now he's talking to God. You are with me. Even in the darkest hour when it appears that he's engulfed in darkness and in gloom and evil, he's not even going to begin to enter into a state of fear because he knows who his shepherd is. He knows where his shepherd is. And he knows how much his shepherd loves him. God's care for his sheep permeate every aspect of our lives. And furthermore, it's important to note that this valley of deep darkness doesn't stand by itself. It's a continuation from the verse before it, which means what? This is the righteous path. Part of the righteous paths that he leads us on lead us through valleys of deep darkness. And so what do you think when we fight against and complain against what God has ordained for us, that he calls righteous paths for our good. Is it appropriate for us to fight against it? Most of us are looking at this, this COVID-19 situation like we do most trials. This, how you're responding to this right now will probably tell you how you respond to most of your trials. When will it be over? I just want this to be over. 
You're not trusting God. You're not trusting in his sovereignty. You can say, oh, God just didn't take him by surprise and all of these things all day long. But if you're saying, oh, when will this be over? I just want this to be over. You don't really believe that God is sovereign over this. Because if you really believe that God was sovereign over this, you would say, Lord, help me to glorify you in this time. Right? That's what we would be saying. I'll bet you if you analyze how you handle other trials, you probably handle them the same way you're handling this one. When is this going to be over? It's disturbing my, interrupting my, whatever that might be. This path in the valley of deep darkness is part of the righteous paths. Yahweh does not promise his sheep that they will have all of their obstacles removed. That's not what it says here. That they're going to float through life without any adversity. But he has a better plan for his own. That involves not only the testing that comes from the valleys, but also the confidence that comes from the shepherd. And that's what we need to learn, the confidence that comes from the shepherd. How appropriate that at the darkest point of this psalm, David turns and makes it personal. The Lord is my shepherd. He, 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 his, you. You call out to God in times of danger. There's no need to even begin to enter into a state of fear because Yahweh is present. He's present with all of us right now, even though we're not gathered physically. We're united in one spirit. And this does not take him by surprise. There is no need for us to fear. And so what about you, Christian? Do you make your theology personal during these valleys of deep darkness? Do you sit there and go, well, God is sovereign, so I'm going to go over here and be afraid? Or do you say, well, God is sovereign, so you, God, or you could say it this way. Do you flee to the theos behind the theology? Do you flee theology, a word of God, right? Do you flee to him? I know these things so that I might flee to him. The God of the word, the shepherd of your soul. Remember, fear dethrones God and magnifies the creature. It is idolatry. And then he continues on. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Your rod. I mean, this word is packed with history and application. But just to skim over and give you a little introduction to the word, its first use is in Genesis 49.10, the scepter that shall not depart from Judah, the prophecy concerning Christ that Jacob gave. It's the same word used in the Proverbs to refer to the discipline that fathers are to lovingly give to their children and the rod that the Lord uses to discipline Israel. It's a wooden rod fashioned from a tree, almost like that of a billy club. For the shepherd, it's kind of like his leatherman. It's his do-it-all kind of tool. It's used for counting the sheep, for gathering the sheep, for attacking predators, for protecting the sheep. It does all of these things. And it's the same word that's used in Psalm 2.9, referring to Christ will rule the nations with a rod, same word, of iron. In ancient Near Eastern context, it was not uncommon for leaders to be uh, shepherds as their people. They were often regarded as part of their sheep and their flock. Therefore, this rod was symbolized as the authority over. Kings would have this. Kings would be called shepherds. They would have their rod. That's why we see that scepter. It's part of that ruling, part of that shepherding. And the staff was much different than the rod. It's better known as the shepherd's crook. You know, you've probably seen some of those things in some old movies when they reach out, somebody's on stage and they're not very good and they pull them off with something, this long kind of cane thing. The shepherd's crook. Or it's kind of like we have in the logo for our church. And this would be roughly five to six feet long with a curve on the end. And it would be used for guiding and for pulling them out when they get stuck and then it doubled as a walking stick. You've probably seen some shepherds that have this. But what does he say here? He says, they comfort me. These things, they comfort me. 
These instruments are the means by which Yahweh interacts within the life of David and all believers. These are the visible manifestations of Yahweh's work in David's life. These are his means of guidance, discipline, correction, and protection. The fact that Yahweh is the one intervening in David's life brings, brings David great comfort. Now, I think we would all agree that his staff, the, the long one that he used for protecting and for guiding, I think we'd all agree that's comforting. But how many of us would agree that his rod is comforting? When you think about the discipline of the Lord and you think about his rod, is the first thing that comes to your mind comfort? Are we thankful for God's discipline in our lives? You know we should be, because that's our birth certificate. It shows that we truly are his children. When was the last time you experienced comfort from your good shepherd's discipline? How do you respond to correction? How do you respond to discipline? Either from God, for his, from his under shepherds, or just from one another with other believers? They should be, for us, comfort. Comfort. They promote assurance. They promote assurance. And we look in now verses 5 and 6. Our third and final main heading, David's assurance. David's assurance. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Here this, this image appears to shift from that of Yahweh being a shepherd to what? Now he's, he's a host. He's a host. The table, the cup are used in dining with humans, not with sheep. Dining was an intimate type of fellowship, as we all know. Hospitality was huge in that culture. They weren't individualistic. They were community. Kind of like when we had Dicegate coming and talking about how everything's about community. That's the same thing that they had going on here. And this wasn't something that only those who shared, or this was something, excuse me, that those who shared communion would have together. You remember what happened when Peter, when Paul writes Peter in, in, um, in Galatians, and he writes about him. Why is he writing about him? Peter, there he was fellowshipping with these Gentiles, and then the Jewish people come over, and then he's just like, oh, whoa, no, 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 can't be with you anymore. I was never really with you. There's that separation, because in this Jewish context, that was just with this group of people. In the church context, fellowship is only with believers. It doesn't mean that we don't spend time with other people, but that actually Christian fellowship is only with those who are in Christ. Everything else we're trying to do, evangelism. It's a different kind of relationship. This laying out a table is more akin to a banquet or a feast than just a plain dinner. Notice the great care by the host. Notice the lavishness, the celebration, the festiveness. And you know the expense of a banquet always belongs to who? The one that provides the table. So David's not paying for any of this. God is doing all of this. And where does he do this? He says, in front of my enemies. Do you have enemies? Do you have enemies? Christ had enemies. Do you have enemies? David had enemies. I'm not talking about are there people that you don't like. I'm talking about are there people that don't like you because of Christ? Not because you're a jerk or you're insensitive, but because you love Christ and you live for Christ and they can't stand it and they hate you. Having enemies for the cross of Christ is a sign of discipleship. It's part of assurance. People hated Christ. They should hate us too. 
So preparing a table, now this increases the tension because the enemies are present. What do you expect when you've got enemies around you and you're outside? What kind of a meal do you expect? You're in war, you're in a battle. You expect, all right, let's have a picnic. No, it's like a sack lunch. Here, take this, I'm just gonna eat this. This is all I need to get through what I've gotta do. But that's not how God does things. It's lavish. This isn't a common practice in battle, but this is a divine pause. Now remember, did Yahweh remove the valley of deep darkness from David? No, he didn't. Does he remove the enemies from David? No, he doesn't. But what does he do in light of that? He gives grace. He gives grace. We shouldn't be looking for God to remove this situation from us that we're in right now or any other trial that we have, we should be asking that God would give us grace so that we might live for him during these times. Yahweh provided the security for David to be able to eat in the presence of his enemies. Yahweh supplied grace. And just like Peter, when Jesus says, Satan has asked that he might sift you like we, our first thought is, well, would you... Did you tell him no? Did you tell him to go away? Like he can't do that? But I've prayed for you, that your faith will not fail. What a comfort it is, though, when we actually look at that and we know that Christ intercedes for his own because he didn't pray for Judas, but he prayed for Peter. You refresh my head with oil. This is not the common term for, for anointing, but it carries the idea of making fat. You make it fat. Fat was a grand commodity in those times, and it is synonymous with being prosperous. And it fits well here. It was the guests of the feast that had their heads refreshed or anointed with oil, not in a ceremonial way, but more of like revitalization, of weary from, from their travel, from their work, and they're refreshed. Jesus uses this term in Luke chapter 7, 46. You did, you gave me no kiss, but since she came in, she's not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. And then he says, my cup overflows. Literally, this is my cup is full to the brim. You know when you've got a cup and you fill it up, and you fill it up and you get to that point where it's beveled over on top. It's not, it's not spilling yet because you've got that covalent bond going on, but it's beveled over and it, instead of being flat on the top, it's kind of arced, but all the liquid's still in there. That's what this word is. When we need things, when we need help, like James says, God doesn't get stingy with the giving when we're in trials and we ask for wisdom, he doesn't reproach us. He gives generously. That's what, that's what David is saying here. The cup is our portion in life. David's lot is so abundantly full of blessings, not even the dark times are cause for worry, but amplify the riches that he's been given from his shepherd. God doesn't say, hey, I've taken away the valley of deep darkness, I've taken away your enemies, and I've given you this stuff. No, I've given you what you need to get through that. And in the banquet setting, this would be filled with the best wine. But here Yahweh fills David's cup with bountiful provisions. Notice this, that the cup that David had and the cup that Jesus had, neither of them had the cup they deserved. And so it is with us. God does not give us the cup we deserve because he didn't give Christ the one he deserved. It's in the midst of our trials, of our sufferings, and of every kind of valley of deep darkness that we must not focus on the situation, but the God who holds us, who shepherds us during these times. The God who gives us the grace we don't deserve. As is evidenced by this last verse, surely, Goodness and loving kindness will follow me 
all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is Yahweh's pursuit. Yahweh's pursuit. The stress here is focused on the goodness, and loving kindness is loyal love. It's that covenant-keeping love. But God will not change. He's holding fast. These are attributes of Yahweh, and David personifies them, gives wings to them, so that they fly to chase down his people. It's goodness and loyal love that will pursue him because of his shepherd. The word for pursuit that's used here, or follow in your translation, is the same word when Pharaoh and the Egyptians are pursuing after the Israelites after they've left, before they're captured into the Red Sea. It's an aggressive pursuit. The same determination and single focus of mind is being stressed here, but this positive light is Yahweh is the one who's ordained goodness and this covenant love to be pursuing David, and by extension and application, pursuing all of his own. And then he says, I will return, or I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This word is the same that we've seen earlier. He restores my soul. That word for restores, same word here. It has that idea of return. I will return to the house of the Lord. Into, I'm going to go into this house. The psalm has incorporated a whole bunch of scenes. We've seen scene after scene after scene to try and wrap our arms around the magnificence of this shepherd that we have that loves us and that cares for us, even in the midst of COVID-19, especially in the midst of COVID-19. God is our shepherd. He's leading his people. We have no need to fear. This is a location that's been visited in the past, the house of the Lord, and will be sustained by Yahweh. And you know what this means forever, for a length of days, endless and endless days. David is asserting that because of the goodness, because of the loyal love and the pursuit of Yahweh, he will return to the house of the Lord as his final resting place. That's what we have to hope for. And we see this. We see this tender care best in the face of Jesus Christ. He is our senior pastor. He is our chief shepherd. Shepherd means pastor. Pastor means shepherd. He exhibited loyal love in his sacrificial and condescending life and death. He calls us by name. If you're in Christ, you were on his mind when he went to the cross. He did that for his sheep. No one, not even by our power, can be snatched from his hand. I've heard people say, well, yeah, no one can snatch from his hand, but some can walk out. Well, then you would be snatching someone, namely yourself, from his hand. And Jesus even says, no one can snatch him from my hand. And I'm in the Father's hand. We are guarded over. What is COVID-19? to this love and sovereignty and omnipotence. He's gone to prepare a place for us. He's given us, have you ever thought about this? When the spirit descended like a dove and came on Christ, and then he lived that spirit-filled life? Think about it. How many Holy Spirits are there? There's one. Do you have the Holy Spirit? If you're in Christ, yes, you do. So which Holy Spirit do you have? The only one. The same one that was in Christ. He's given us the promise that he'll never leave us or forsake us. He's given us a command also, in the midst of these times, to trust in him, to make disciples. These things don't stop. God's word is not quarantined. Satan is not quarantined. Though we may be quarantined after a sense, we need to find fresh new ways to follow these commands in love. He's given us the command to love one another as he loves us. This is not a time that we can afford to forget our Savior or sinfully be disobedient. This is a time for us to let our lights shine. It is dark out there. This is a valley of deep darkness. We need the light of Christ to shine. I mean, we can say all day long, well, God's going to be glorified through this, and God's going to be glorified through this. And I'll say, yes, he is, with or without you. 
God doesn't work apart from his people. When he does, that's very rare and that's called a miracle. But the normal everyday means of secondary causation working in the lives of other secondary causation people, that's how God works. And so if we're going to say, yeah, well, God's sovereign and he's going to be glorified and this and that, that if you're not going to be part of him being glorified, of his name being spread as holy, that's an indictment upon you to say that. I don't want that for you. And you don't want that for you. If we trust that God is sovereign and that his name will be glorified, what is the next thing we should say? Here am I. Lord, send me. How can you, what capacity can I serve you with? Don't let sinful fear take your focus off of your shepherd. And don't let sinful fear take your focus and distract you from the duties of discipleship. This season in life is but a drop in the ocean compared to the goodness and the loyal love that we will experience as we dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Love your shepherd enough to turn off the news, meditate on his excellencies, love his sheep, and proclaim those same excellencies while serving this lost and dying world that needs the light of Christ around us. Amen? Let's pray and then we'll close with our final song. And Father, we thank you that your word is clear, that your love is eternal, that your power is sovereign, that your glory is imminent, that Christ will return. Lord, help us to be wise in the midst of these dark times. Let us not lose focus of why we're here. Let us not fall into that trap of fear. But let us pursue Christ day by day as we see the end is coming near. Amen.